Come and see what everyone's talking about. La ilaha illallah. Allah. There's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Today in the studio we have Sheikh Kamal al Meki. When we come back here on the Dean Show, we are going to answer some of the top five misconceptions about Islam. And then we're going to clear out the junk from the trunk. And then we're going to deliver the sweet message of Islam for all of those that have been inspiring to know the truth. We're going to give you the clear, simple explanation of Islam when we come back here on The Dean Show. There's only one God and Jesus was his messenger, Allah, la ilaha illallah. I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. How you been? 100%. People can, on the deanshow.com, they can visit. You have your own private special section. They can click there on your picture and they can view some of the other shows that we've done with you. I feel honored. Alhamdulillah. To have my own section on the deanshow.com. That's it. Fantastic. Let the world know. Excellent. We like to keep it really simple. Very good. So for the not yet Muslims who are tuning in and the Muslims who want to be able to explain Islam, but there are some Arabic terms and some misconceptions associated with some words. So we're going to give the people five of some of the common basic misconceptions that people have about some of these words. You'll define them, explain them, and at the end we'll get rid of the junk out of the trunk and then we'll go ahead and explain everything in full so they can understand Islam a little bit better. Sounds like a Let's plan. start with this word Allah. Okay. People think that this is some Arab God or this is a moon God and they have this misnotion about this word Allah. So let's start with this word Allah. Excellent. Very good. Uh, you know, the, the whole uh, moon god and whatever other claim, they actually, specifically the moon god, there's actually no evidence to this whatsoever. Uh, there's no record of any moon god called Allah. But unfortunately, it was people throughout his history who couldn't explain away Islam. And so they had to, the best thing they could do is to forge some kind of lie about it and said that Allah was some kind of moon god in Arabia. And if that were the case, there would be a lot of evidence to that. There would be Arab poetry talking about this moon god, but we don't have anything of that sort. The name Allah is very simply, uh, or the word Allah is the name of God in Arabic. And I always tell people if you go to any country where there are Jews who speak Arabic, you'll find them saying Allah. You know, Morocco, Yemen, there's some Jews, and they say Allah. And if you go to a church in any Muslim country or any Arab country, and you'll see that the Arabic Bible says Allah, and those people say Allah. So sometimes you hear people say things like, you know, Allah is not the God of Moses. So you really, and, and Christians would say that. So now, what would an Arab Christian say to this? They would be very offended by that because they worship Allah. And it's a known fact that Muslims, Christians, and Jews, they do worship the same God. They believe in the same prophets. Even the same geographic locations are in both scriptures. The next common myth and misconception is that people, they have Islam synonymous with terrorism. Right. How would you go ahead and explain this away? Well, you know, we have a joke about that. When we're in the street talking to people and they ask us, does Quran tell people to tell Muslims to kill other people? And we always would tell them that, well, if that was the case, we wouldn't be talking right now, you know? <laughs> you know? So, uh, actually, there is, uh, you know, terrorism is not part of Islam. And there isn't a, a verse that commands terrorism or anything of that sort. But, you know, the history of all religions, not just Islam, is that there will always be people who will either use religion to support their cause or to support their, you know, their, their struggle and uh, others who will say, you know, we're doing it because of this verse or that verse. But you have to consider the, you know, 1.3 or more billion Muslims on the planet. If all of them were, if part of their religion was to go out and terrorize and to kill people, then there would be a lot more havoc on earth. But then why is it that we find only a small handful of people who use the religion's name, you know, to commit terror or things of that sort? Because 
those are people who choose to you know, interpret things in a certain way and go in that direction. But if it was the general mainstream, then everybody would have been doing it. So there is no scripture or part of scripture that says go and do that. So this is not, and has nothing to do with Islam, like 9-11, this, even Muslims died in 9/11. Exactly, uh, I mean, and uh, and nobody, you know, uh, nobody wants to consider that. So Muslims died on, in these buildings as well. So you know, how could that be part of Islam? To also, if if you're claiming Islam says kill non-Muslims, then why did Muslims get killed in this incident as well? And many other things, like even uh, like even in Saudi Arabia itself, they had a, a number of terror acts uh, where civilians and Muslims got killed. So that means then we're dealing with specific like rogue individuals who are extremists or who have made interpretations in such a way, and they use certain uh, scripture to say this is how we justify these actions. So we've had also, I know I have it on the deanshow.com, I've had other scholars on the show that have condemned this, and even when it happened, is it true that many of the top scholars, they didn't get much media press, but they all condemned hijacking airplanes, killing innocent women and children, 9-11, 7-7, whatever, Times Square bomber, all these things are not according with the teachings of Islam? Right, uh, it's not according to Islam and uh, the majority of scholars, if not every living scholar, but still like you said, they don't get enough media attention and what you hear is uh, why don't the Muslim scholars come out and, 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 you know, and say this and that, and they do, but nobody listens to them. And at the same time also, it's very unfair where you know, a, a non-Muslim would do the exact same thing that a Muslim would do, but it's not referred to as terrorism. And I remember, because I live in the Washington DC area, or I used to live, and we had a couple of years ago what was known as the DC sniper. Yes. And this guy would go around and shoot people as they're coming from work and leaving the store and things like that. But it was fantastic, I was listening, and he was terrorizing, everybody was afraid to get gas during those days. But I remember clearly listening to the radio and they say, and the authorities have said that the sniper is not, repeat, not a terrorist. What do you mean he's not a terrorist? He's terrorizing people. Yeah. But what it really meant was that, you know, this is not a Muslim. <laughs> but he was terrorizing people, so he yeah. should be a terrorist by definition. So there's also, a, a, you know, it's not very fair when it comes to the media. The other day there was a guy, this was many years ago, he, packed his tr uh, he parked his tractor, he had a tractor, and he's a farmer. And he said he had enough, the amount of explosives that brought down the Oklahoma building. And there was a two-day standoff with him. And the newspapers only said, disgruntled farmer. This guy had bombs like the ones used in Oklahoma. And he only said, disgruntled farmer. I would just love if that guy had a little bit of a beard and he was, you know, Muslim. It would not say disgruntled uh, farmer or disgruntled. It would immediately be a terrorist. Yeah, but there, there, was, there was a man who actually, he flew a plane into the IRS building. And in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, they, uh, a man blew up a, or tried to blow up a mosque and they didn't get much press, no. nor were they called terrorists. No, but if the name was Hassan or Ali, he'd be a terrorist. This is wrong. This is it's hypocritical. Not it's not fair. We're people of peace who call people to peace, to acquire peace by submitting to the owner of peace, the one creator. Excellent. That's it. Now right. let's take a break and we'll be more back with more of the common misconceptions here on The Dean Show. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side, I am not afraid to stand alone. One God, worship Him alone. Do what He wants you to do. Put your desires, this thing inside you that just wants this and wants that and you just can't get enough. You know what? You'll never get enough until the dirt's in your mouth. Don't let it come to that. Be sincere and honest. Ask the one who created you to guide you. It's the first step. Put off chasing all the women and the good times and the parties and this and that. There is no one worthy of worship except Allah. Don't wait. You never know if death would come today for you or not. Back here on The Dean Show, next one, getting right into it. We went from number five, four, now to three, that Islam subjugates the woman, oppresses the woman. Go ahead and take it away. What do we have to say? 
Well, the best thing we can say is ask Muslim women. You see them in the streets all over the place. You know what they wear. Ask them if they feel that they're oppressed. Ask them if they're putting on this garment because of their husband, because of pressure from the society, or they're doing it out of conviction that they're doing this for their Lord. And so, and if you look also uh, in, in the, you know, Orthodox Jews, the women cover, the, in Christianity, uh, many different denominations, you'll find the women cover and they cover their head. And tell you something else, you know, obviously when you read the Bible, it tells you that you know, the woman is not supposed to go with her hair uncovered, her head uncovered in the church. It clearly says this in the Shave Bible. Shave her head off. Right? Well, <laughs> there's one o other thing that happens. Yeah. You know, they still do this today. That's why if you look in, in the States specifically, always the woman will wear a hat to church. That hat to church is the remnant, is the remainder of that order to not go into church with your head uncovered. Yeah. So even the woman wears her hat to church, she doesn't really know why she's doing it, but she's doing it initially because people used to not uncover. So now Jew Jews, they're not supposed to uncover, and the Christian women are not supposed to uncover, but the ones following their scripture primarily would be the Muslims, and so now they're singled out as the ones who are, you know, whatever, oppressed or this and that, but everybody's supposed to be doing that to begin with. Wasn't the church for some time contemplating if the woman even had a soul? Yeah, there were all kinds of issues, and if you could, you know, you would inherit the woman and all kinds of things. And while this was going on in Europe and in other places, Islam had already given the woman her rights, and she was not a piece of furniture, and she was respected. But again, it takes, you know, the honest individual who is going to go out and ask questions, seeking the truth and seeking the right answer. And if you examine, and you can stop people and ask them and speak to them, and you'll see the truth, that it's not about oppression or anything of that sort. That the Prophet Muhammad, and they throw certain false allegations on him, that he was a warlord, that he was about war and fighting and womanizing, what do we have to say? Right, if he was about war, wars wouldn't have stopped, and he wouldn't have signed peace treaties, and he wouldn't have, uh, you know, refused to uh, shed blood, and even when he was victorious and conquered the city of Mecca that had oppressed Muslims for years, when he gave the standard to one of the soldiers, that soldier said, Today Allah will humiliate the Quraysh, which is the tribe of Mecca, and today is the day of bloodshed. So what did he do? He took the standard from him and gave it actually to his son, Qais, the son of Sa'd ibn Ubad. So the truth is then, if he wanted war, you know, well, keep sp spilling blood. But why go through peace treaties? Why settle in places and not go to war and why all these things. So if he was a warlord, wouldn't stop at anything. Just like, you know, in history, Napoleon, for example, you know, he didn't stop at anything. He just kept going and going and only the weather would stop him. He would come back from Russia and then he would go to Egypt and just kept killing, you know. So that's one thing. Uh, woman, <clears throat> as far as being a womanizer, you know, the womanizer uh, doesn't get one or two or three or four wives. There's no limit. You know, in the Qur'an there's a verse that limits and tells the Prophet that he cannot take any wife after this, right? And if he were a womanizer, then he, there wouldn't be any limit and he would marry as many as possible. But his first wife was 15 years older than him. She was 40 and he was 25 and she was twice widowed. A womanizer doesn't marry someone like that. They marry a young girl who's still a virgin, things like that. He stayed with her for 15 years. Now again, a womanizer wouldn't stay with one woman for that long. They just keep getting married. Especially if you can pretend to be a prophet and people think you're a prophet of God, you could put it right in your scripture. Tell people, hey, you want to bless your wives? Bring them to the prophet. You want to bless your daughters? Bring them to the prophet. But that wasn't the case. And so when we review and analyze the actions and the marriages of the Prophet ﷺ, we come to a clear conclusion that he was not doing it out of love of women. And we actually see other wisdoms behind his marriages, but again, it's for the truthful people to examine it unbiasedly. So th we're making this short, short and sweet, so you can see that these things are just a lot of childish accusations that are thrown out. Some people are just going with the flow and not really thinking, but if any thinking man or woman come to this with an open heart and open mind, they can see that a lot of these are just foolish, foolish things that really hold no weight. Absolutely, and if there, were tr if there was any truth to these things, a lot of Muslims wouldn't be Muslims. But the Muslims, you know, we, we examine them and we know that it doesn't add up. The accusation doesn't add up, and that's why they don't hold much water. Muslims, they say, worship a black box in the desert. Right, and uh, that the, the black box is, is a sacred house, and it is not worshipped whatsoever. It's just part of the ritual that it's circumambulated seven times. 
And part of those rituals also have to deal with submission because Islam means submission. And not to a man, to a monkey, but submit to the one God who created you. And so uh, part of submitting is we do certain actions. Like for example, when we go around the sacred house, which we believe was built as early as the Prophet Adam and rebuilt again the foundations by the Prophet Abraham or Ibrahim. And then, so it has, it's a sacred place and it has a great place in the hearts of, of the believers. And so part of the ritual is to go and circumambulate the sacred house. Now, just like when you go to a church, you don't worship the church building. When you go to a mosque, you don't worship the mosque building. When you go to a synagogue, you don't worship the building. But that's where you do the worship. And so when you go to Kaaba, to, the, to Mecca, you do the worship in that area, in the courtyard and around the physical structure. You're not worshipping the structure. And obviously, anything that's worshipped besides Allah is greatly shunned and discouraged and prohibited to worship anything besides Allah in Islam. Now tell us, and go ahead please, because okay, we moved some of the junk out of the way, and now while many other man-made religions, they're very difficult to understand. The divine religion, the way of life system from the Creator has to be simple and has to fit what's with what's deep inside. So show them just how simple it is when, you, when you're able to just explain the basic message of Islam in let's say two minutes or three. Absolutely, we can do it in two minutes because it's so simple and Allah would only reveal something to you that you could understand and you could fathom as a human being. So it's really simple and nothing is easier than the number one. Four isn't, three isn't, and seven isn't. One God who's indivisible, doesn't have children, doesn't have relatives or grandparents or partners or neighbors or anything of that sort. This one God c created all of humanity and out of His fairness He communicates with them. The best way to talk to them is through sending prophets and messengers rather than appearing to them. Because if He appears, He has to appear for every generation and for everyone that's being born as we speak, they need to see this. So the, most, the thing that makes the most sense is that He sends prophets and messengers. These are good, noble and chosen people from amongst a nation or a group and Allah will communicate with them through the Archangel Gabriel. And this has been the situation if you read throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament and the Quran. This is how Allah communicates but He sent His final Prophet and Messenger Muhammad in Arabia 1400 years ago and He's not sending any Prophet after Him because He's going to preserve His message. So this is the easiest and the most digestible thing for the human being is that there's one God sends prophets, sent all the great prophets that we believe in as Muslims and he sent the final messenger Muhammad Sallallahu and all of them came with the same basic message so it's evidence that they came from the same school. And that's it. Simple. Simple as that. And thank you. We're out of time. My pleasure. May God Almighty Allah reward you once again for being with us. We look forward to having I many, mean, many more shows with like you khair, in the My pleasure. Thank you. Anytime. And that's it. That's all we have. We just wanted to give you a taste, move out the junk that's in the trunk and deliver the clear message of Islam. Continue to come back here every week to the Dean Show to get a free copy of the translation of the Quran, 1-800-662-ISLAM. Continue every week we're here with a new show. Also check out our radio show and we'll see you next time. Inshallah, God willing. Until then, peace be unto you. One of the beautiful things about our religion of Islam is the emphasis on direct ritual and prayer to God directly. There is no intermediary. The lights will go on after the party and the party will end. It's very simple and very clear. There are no superstitious rituals, no strange incantations. It's Time is running out. We might not make it till tomorrow. And this is something that we need to think about. No speech is better than to do that, to call people to Allah and to do the work. No speech is better. No, nothing is better than that. Is it true that if one person on the Allah giving you the ability to guide someone with Allah's permission, the Creator's permission, that is better than everything in this world? Better than the whole world and everything that's in it, in, in another narration, it's better than the best of wealth. But if we really felt that, Eddie, would we not be give, out giving down? And this is something that we encourage all the MSAs, all the Dawah organizations, the masjids to get this. We want to print more. We give these to the non-Muslims for free, for free, for free. We want our brothers in humanity to become our brothers in faith. And it's cold, it's late, everybody's sleeping. I arise and ask Allah to forgive me.
Oh Allah, you see. Oh Allah, you know all the sins I do. I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart. I'm your sinful slave. You're my loving Lord. I'm the one who runs away. Oh Allah, guide me.